So with about three weeks left to go on my federal prison sentence, the reality hit me. I am utterly useless. I, I, I'm not getting anything done. And my good friend and now business partner, Michael Santos, called it a short time itis, right? The fact that I was so close to my release and I was so obsessed about my life on the other side of prison boundaries that I couldn't focus on what was in front of me. So rather than try, I surrendered and embraced the reality for that for the next few weeks until I'm released, I'm going to be utterly useless. I got a few runs in. I did a little writing, a little reading, but essentially I wandered <laughs> around that dusty dirt track alone, not wanting to engage with anyone. If you've been to federal prison, I would love to know how you felt as you were getting closer to your release, what you were, were you nervous? Were you scared? Were you obsessed about what life would be like? Were you happy? I know some dudes were scared uh, getting ready to go home because they just weren't ready. And I wasn't sure if I was ready either. And I only served a year in a minimum security camp. So I suffered from short-term itis. Did you? I would love to know. Now, it's super easy to talk about what you're going to do after prison when you're in prison. It's sort of like when I lecture at business schools across the country and I tell business students, it's very easy to say that you're going to be honest, ethical, and fair in a classroom if your parents are paying for your tuition, if you're on a scholarship. It's measurably different when you're going to face some of the pressures that accompany living and functioning in this modern world. So it was super easy to write in lessons from prison, always going to be honorable. I'm never going to succumb to adversity. I'm going to overcome it. I'm going to be grateful and humble and appreciative. It's easy to write it while in federal prison. It is another thing to live it. To that end, this video is going to share 10. I made a lot of bad choices when I came home, but I want to film this video to help all of you who will someday be home from federal prison. I care about you. And if I don't know you, even if you don't work with us, I care about you because I know what it's like to go through it. And we want to, we want to help you. And I don't want you to make some of these choices or bad mistakes that I made because it could derail the progress and everything you are hoping to accomplish. So with hopes that it helps all of you make better choices, I'm going to dive into mistakes I made when I came home from prison. I have a blog that I wrote up on the left. I'm going to read a line from the blog. And then every one of these takeaways has a lesson. Number one, constant comparison to others. I fell into the trap upon my release from prison of constantly comparing my progress with others, which engendered anxiety and discontentment. I learned from this experience that everyone's journey is distinct and focusing on individual growth and progress is crucial. Instead of getting caught up in comparing myself to others, I eventually began to prioritize my own development. So when you go to prison, your life is even as progress or as productive as you can be in prison. It doesn't change that you are confined in life in many ways moves on and we can feel without us. Then you come home and it's right in front of you. Like how much have you lost? Elaine building a family, growing a business, just moving on to the next phase while we've been living in this island is easy or difficult as it seemed to be. So when I came home from prison and frankly, it took me 10 years to overcome this, it took me 10 years to begin to learn to live really differently. But I had this obsession of comparing myself to other people, my friends, even family members who were at points in their life where I was supposed to be. And what I should have done was compare myself to the fact that I was a federal prisoner a little while ago, that I had been to prison and made bad decisions. And there are significant collateral consequences that accompany going to federal prison. I should have done a better job of embracing that. I wrote about it in Lessons from Prison, but it's again, easier to write it. It's another thing to live it. I hated that I was comparing myself to others. I don't want you to come. I don't want you to come home and do that. Focus on what remains, remain grateful, remain humble, and recognize that there are indeed people who always have it worse. I hated this constant comparison to, to other people. Number two, overlooking small victories. I wrote being obsessed with achieving grand objectives. I often overlooked appreciating the smaller wins, which left me feeling perpetually unfulfilled. The lesson here is to celebrate every success, no matter how minor and learn to appreciate the opportunities that come your way. I didn't do that, right? So I come home from prison. I have someone willing to offer me a part time, a job, a minimum wage job. And I took it because all work is honorable and I needed to fulfill my obligations to work in the halfway house. But instead I'm like, wow, I'm 33 with a degree from USC picking up phones. Instead, I should have said, I'm so grateful for this opportunities. Even when people began to call us at the time, it was just Justin Paperni. Attica LLC. There was no white collar advice. There was no brand. There was no media. There were no clients. But people had read this blog I wrote in prison and people would call. And I think, well, why aren't more people calling? I worked every day to write a blog. Why aren't three people called today? Why didn't 10? Again, I wasn't appreciating small victories 
along the way. I didn't appreciate that I gave a lecture in front of 80 people, which was terrible and horrific and put people to sleep. They were drooling. I wanted to give one dude a napkin or tissue because he was sleeping and drooling. Instead, I should have said, it is a victory that I had the courage to stand up here and speak to people about my experience as terrible as it was. When you come, I know you want to make the money and I know you want the reputation back and I know you want to build a business and I know you want to be successful, but be different for me. Appreciate every small victory along the way. The job, your friend standing alongside your probation officer allowing you to work from home, your probation officer allowing you to travel. If you can appreciate these small successes, you will feel much more fulfilled. Instead, I didn't appreciate them. And I used to think this isn't where I'm supposed to be. And it held me back. Number three, seeking validation from others. The need for external validation overshadowed my focus on providing value through my services. I learned to concentrate on delivering value to others without being swayed by their immediate perception of me. Like So when I came home from prison, I didn't want to be perceived as, as a prisoner. I wanted to be perceived as, as a I didn't want to be perceived as a prisoner. I had just been released from prison. So I used to like obsess over this book. I just got a little bookmark on my hand. Have you seen my book? Have you seen my book? Have you seen my book? And that's so foreign to me. Like my success, I am humble. I am deferential. I am kind. But I was like so trying to overdo the fact that I had been to prison. Like, have you read my book? It's free. Have you read my book? It's free. Hoping that people, people don't read it. I don't even know if my parents read it. The point is people don't read to the degree that they did. The point that I had, I should have just handed it to them if they had interest. And if they found value in it, they would have called. We would have discussed it. Instead, I was hoping people was like, how was prison? What did you do? I read your daily prison book. Oh, you got into better shape. I, I was like narcissistic for a while thinking that people cared. They don't. And part of the reason I didn't have the immediate success I felt I should have had when I came home from prison, besides not appreciating the small victories and continuing to compare myself to other people is because I needed this validation from others that I was productive in prison, that I did write that blog, I did write that book. And at the end of the day, I wasn't providing value to people because all you care about is how can I help you? That's the only reason you're watching this video, whether you're going to prison or not, what is in it for you? And when I began to talk about what was in it for you, how you could better prepare for sentencing, how you can learn how to hold a lawyer accountable, how you can be productive in prison, that's when things began to change. But if you're coming home from prison, I, like, I want you to not need this validation. I want you day one, focus on providing value to other people and just do the work sometimes and wonder if you'll get paid. For example, I hired someone recently to do thumbnails on the White Collar Advice channel. He didn't reach, he's someone who's been to prison. He didn't reach out and say, will you hire him? You know what he did? He said, here are two thumbnails I've created for two recent videos you did. Do you like them? I'm like, yeah, these are awesome. And he's like, great, would you love to work with me? I'm like, of course, you've already provided value. Come home and provide value, even if some people ignore it, dismiss it, don't care. Once I got ready and got back to providing value, everything changed. I should have done it from day one. Number four, trying to revive past relationships. I actually did this in kind of an embarrassing fashion, right? So today's June 2nd, July 4th, 2009. I had my first real pass from the halfway house and I went to a 4th of July party at a friend of mine's home. And a lot of people were there that I had known throughout my life. A lot of who were now celebrities were there like Courtney and Kim Kardashian, who I'd known for a while, Rob Kardashian, a good dude. I played on a baseball team with him for many years. So I ran into like a lot of these old friends and they weren't really friends anymore but I thought they'd be so excited to see me because we played baseball together and we were friends and we went to school together. And I thought that they'd be super excited to hear about my progress in, in prison. I would discuss it with them. How's your family? What's new? How have you been? Without recognizing they didn't write me in prison. They didn't have interest in seeing me in, in prison. They don't, they don't care. Yet here I am trying to revive a relationship that had clearly ended by sharing my life and background and prison term and progress with them. Nobody cared. And I lost some dignity in the process trying to impress people. So if you go to prison, there is fallout. You're going to lose friendships. You're going to suffer consequences for a, a lifetime. And that's okay. So one thing that I did when I came home from prison, it took me a long time to embrace the reality. Some relationships just end. And you know what? It's all good. You should be focusing on the people that are coming in to your own life. Actually, when I was at that July 4th party, I had to step outside for a few minutes and I was like, what am I doing? Nobody cares. Some people care, but nobody cares. They've moved on. I need to move on as well. Number five, lack of fun. I wrote here, being overly concentrated on my career, I had little fun leading to burnout and dissatisfaction. I learned that balance is essential in allocating time 
for relaxation and enjoyment is as crucial as working towards your goals. By incorporating fun and leisure into my routine, I became more productive, fulfilled, and able to sustain a healthy work-life balance. That's the truth, man. Like I was having no fun. Even when I began to travel the country speaking on white collar crime and getting paid a lot of money, I wasn't enjoying it. I recall this one event at NYU where I spoke at the Skirball Center in the West Village. And afterwards, I walked throughout the streets of New York. I felt like I, for a few minutes, like I was John Travolta from Saturday Night Live strutting and walking like, wow, I'm nine months out of jail. I just got paid to speak at NYU. This is incredible. And then just like that, I'm like, I can't enjoy this. I'm a convicted felon. I have to pay my restitution. I'm not married. I don't have kids. What am I going to do? Is my probation officer going to approve my next trip? When am I going to start to write my next book, which eventually became Ethics in Motion? Like what's next? I, I couldn't enjoy the moment at all. And in retrospect, I have such regret over so many phenomenal experiences that I didn't fully enjoy speaking in front of tens of thousands of people. I didn't enjoy it because my thoughts were, am I good enough? Do they appreciate the message? Am I providing value coming back to needing the validation? I didn't have any fun. Even these runs that I would do in the, in Santa Monica along the ocean, which would be eight, 10 miles. I didn't enjoy it. Cause I'm like, I want to try to remain fit and strong. I wrote in lessons from prison that fitness would be a part of my life. And I wasn't going to become a big fat bloated slob again. So running didn't even become fun. Like it was in prison. Instead, I need to do this. Have fun when you come home. If you're not living in the home that you were once living in, that's okay. Have some fun. Appreciate the sunset. Appreciate the fact that you're free. You can go walk and get a cup of coffee. I didn't have any fun in that first year. And I wasn't appreciating all the blessings that I had. I am begging you, as tough as it is, as much as you're losing or have lost, and I can relate to it, have some fun. When you do, you're going to feel more fulfilled. You're going to appreciate things. I didn't have any fun and I should have had so much fun. I was 34 years old when I came home from prison and I wasted years not enjoying all the blessings that were coming my way. You can still have fun through struggle. You can still have fun with less money. You can still have fun with a damaged reputation. You can still have fun if you don't have your physicians or legal license anymore. I promise you, learn from me. Number six, postponing relationships due to financial stability. I erroneously believed that I, I erroneously believed I needed financial stability before commencing a new relationship, which resulted in feelings of isolation. I learned that cultivating meaningful relationships is vital, regardless of economic status. There was a, um, as I wrote in Lessons for Prison, I was, I was raised with resources. There was a certain lifestyle that I had grown accustomed to that my parents through hard work provided to me. And when I came home from prison and I began to date, uh, you know, professors, I dated a nice woman who was a professor at Columbia and then NYU and we're spending more time together. And I'm like, I, I can't get married right now. What are, you, what are you people crazy? Even though I'm 34 and most of my friends are 34 married with kids, I'm like, I'm not ready. I'm not making enough money. I still have $400,000 in, in restitution. I like, I haven't paid my health insurance for 18 months because every dollar I make, I put back into the business and self-publish lessons from prison. Like, I'm, I'm not ready. Like, no, no, no. So I like kicked aside, avoided the idea of a relationship with people who, you know, it could have worked out. And then finally that changed two years in when I met my beautiful wife, Sandra, we're now married for nearly 10 years with two young kids. But even when I met Sandra, I'm like, wow, she went to Cornell educated, great career. It's like, I don't think I'm ready for this woman. Like, I'm not ready to, to, to do this yet. I've only been out of jail for two years. I cannot provide the way that my parents provided for me. What I've learned is uh, you're never going to be ready. <laughs> you're never ready for kids, never ready for everything that comes. But when you come home, people are going to love you and care about you for you, the value that you can provide, how you make them feel. And in retrospect, I presumed people would expect me to provide a certain lifestyle and give them things that I had always given to women in relationships that I had had, because that's part of the way I provided value. I was a bad boyfriend, shallow, worked too much. Here's a gift. Here's a watch. Here's a trip. And I didn't quite make that change. So when you come home from prison, if you're dating or starting over or building new relationships, it's never going to be ready. And you know what? They know that and it's okay. And things will eventually get better as it did for me. But don't throw away potential relationships just because you think you aren't ready. Number seven, for too long after my release from prison, I undervalued myself. And what I did, I wrote, because I was a convicted felon, I should be resigned to earn less. The lesson I learned from this mis misconception is that your past does not determine your value. It will help if you value your work and time appropriately, regardless of your background. So here's a story. 
there was, I spoke at the business school at Wake Forest University just after I'd been out of prison for about a year. And if you Google it, Google Justin Paperni, Wake Forest University, you'll see these press announcements around the event. I went to the event for very little money. The value was going to Wake Forest, to top 10 business school, spending time with the dean, who was the former CEO of Pepsi, Steve Reinman, who loved ethics in motion and wrote a review. So the value of going to Wake Forest, besides the traveling and experience, was a little bit of money, but it was the experience of speaking in front of thousands of people. Well, after I went to Wake Forest, I was invited back. And generally, when they invite you back, it's because you did a good job. If they invite you back and you have raving reviews, which I did as a corporate ethics speaker, you should ask for, for more money. Find out what their budget is for an honorarium because I knew other people on the stage were getting paid more than me, which was fine for the first event. Well, an email mistakenly came to me. It wasn't meant to come to me from the professor who organized the event at Wake Forest and essentially said, yeah, Justin's reviews were stellar and he was the highlight of the event. But uh, you know, let's just offer him the same amount of money. He's a you know he's a felon. He'll take it laugh. He'll take it laugh out loud. And I read it and I thought, you know, I need the money. I need the money. I have to pay restitution. I have to live. And this professor just acknowledged it was not a professor from Wake Forest. It was a, a professor from another university who organized this event. I need the money. I'd love to travel and go back to North Carolina and stay at this Greystone Estate. It's awesome. I want to provide value to these students. And you know what? I went and I took it. And I took less money knowing that I was getting paid less than other people, knowing that I had the highest, greatest reviews. And when I went to North Carolina, I felt I shouldn't have gone. I should have held my ground, even if to the point I didn't make the money. But I didn't, I undervalued myself because, yes. I'm a convicted felon and I should be grateful that opportunities are coming to me without recognizing payment should be based on merit, not by need or not by status. The felon class. And indeed, the next year when I went back to Wake Forest, I said, this is my fee. You can pay it or not. That's OK. And guess what? When I was firm and strong and I have evidence on my side, they paid it. Do not undervalue what you do as I did. Number eight, trusting others too easily. Unwavering trust in others without adequate vetting resulted in several professors stealing my work. I learned to exercise caution and thorough due diligence when seeking assistance from others. I used to share with Michael Santos a lot while he was still in prison how many professors, I was speaking at these business schools across the country, but how many professors wanted to collaborate, write a research paper, I kind of just take a lot of these white collar case studies that we were writing about. And I trusted many of these professors. And in the end, they took a lot of the work from lessons from prison, ethics in motion, filming that I had done with like the certified ACFE, the certified, certified fraud examiners or whatever it is. And they like took all of this work and they essentially packaged it up as their own under the idea that it could be good for my brand, the fact that people are going to see it. But they were then kind of like selling a product. Now, keep in mind, I'm 48 now. It's 2023. When I came home from prison, I was 34. It's a long time ago. I was naive. I didn't understand. And I bought into this idea that, hey, that's branding for me. People are going to see my video and what I can do to teach and train. They're going to call and hire me. Indeed, some did. But I regret trusting professors ironically, ethics professors. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when people tell you like, be careful of snake salesmen. And that's the snake salesman. Be careful of those that are going to tell you that's the person you got to be afraid of. So <laughs> like the ethics, some of these ethics professors that speak at length about, you know, values and ethics and always doing the right thing. Those are the one that will put a knife in your back. It's the person that will tell you to your face, I make it take advantage of you and you need to watch out for me. Ah, that's the guy that's going to tell you the truth. It's the one who tells you to be careful about others. That's the dude you got to be careful with. So I trusted others too easily. And frankly, I try to find the good in people. And it's still something even 14 years later that kind of continues to be a problem. But I'm more guarded now. I'm more jaded. And I'm very careful about the people that we bring on to our team. But even then, we, we make mistakes and people that try to harm it, hurt and harm and steal us. There's some competitors in this space, if you want to call, call them competitors, that literally take our work and put it on their website and they don't have the courage to edit out prison professors or white collar advice. They're too dumb. They just steal it. They can't even edit. But I don't work with them. They can steal it. I can't control that, but I won't work with them. I want you to be careful about who you trust. I want you to understand their motives. I want you to understand your tendencies and recognize if you are a pleaser or you need affirmations, that people could use that as a weakness to take advantage of you. Number nine, two more as we wrap up this live video, minimizing the impact of my federal prison time. One mistake I made was tri trivializing my one year in prison, assuming it was insignificant in the grand scheme of my life. Instead of recognizing its profound implications, I overlooked the lasting effects of my time 
behind bars. There was a, you know, like one year in a minimum security camp, like is nothing relative to other what so many, like my friend Gordon Driver's on here. Gordon served seven years. Michael served 26 years. So many, the majority of our clients serve more than a year in, in federal prison. So like, it's really nothing in the totality of our life. And it's nothing relative to how long some people serve. But you know what? In my life, it was a big deal, man. It was a big deal. And there were times when I would come home from, from prison and just um, kind of think, like, well, I've been to prison. Like, how did that happen? And I'd already written the book, Lessons from Prison. I knew how it happened. But it didn't change that I would sit there and think like, man, I've been to prison. Like, that's a really big deal. Call it a club fed. I don't care. Call it a country club. I don't care. Still standing for count. Still separated from my family. It was still prison as I define it. How did I get here? What have I done? So I would often try to minimize the impact of the prison sentence. How are you? I heard you went to prison. Dude, it was great. It was a year. I got into better shape. I read every day. I wrote a book. I learned perspective. You know, I'm humble now and I'm grateful. And it was the best experience of my life. There were parts of it. It was the best experience of my life. But I tended to minimize the fact that I served time in a minimum security camp. And there were days that first year out of prison, the first years out of prison where it just wore me down as I would just sit there and think, I cannot believe I went to federal prison. And it just, it derailed me. And that was a mistake. Here's the takeaway and lesson for all of you. If you've been to federal prison, we're human beings. We make bad decisions. We're human beings. We can overcome them. The only thing that would be humiliating is not the bad choice that you made, but if you fail to respond properly to these charges, right? That's the takeaway here. We're humans. We make bad decisions. We go to prison. The only humiliation is if you don't learn your lesson, articulate how you'll do better, what you're going to do to make amends, how and why you'll never return. If people want to continue to judge them, thank you. Have a nice day. I wish I did that when I came home instead of trying to prove to people how I had changed, bringing people back into my network who didn't give an F about me. Damn, don't do that. And last but not least, number 10, overlooking the persistent effects of my federal prison experience. Initially, I assumed this kind of ties into number nine. Initially, I assumed I could resume life as a federal. I could resume life as I could resume life as if my federal prison experience was a closed chapter with no lingering consequences. Yet I quickly discovered the impact of my incarceration was far from over, how it impacted my personal relationships, my self perception. I realized the sentence doesn't end upon my release from prison, but continues to significantly shape and influence my life. This taught me the valuable lesson of acknowledging and addressing these effects, seeking support and taking proactive steps to navigate the challenges resulting from the experience. The pers persistent effects of my federal prison experience, I didn't fully understand how it would impact marriage and children and my parents and just what I do for a living but think about what I do for a living. I've turned down so many opportunities where I could make, I could be very successful and other opportunities, yet I choose to remain in this space because I love it and I care. But it's awkward, man. It's awkward when my eight-year-old daughter hears me talk about prison. It's awkward when my wife probably has to describe me to her colleagues about what I did. And she's proud of it. Let me be very clear. But it's awkward. I, I didn't. I made a mistake that first year of overlooking the impact that it would have on everyone else in my life, I think, because I was so fixated on me. And in retrospect, I wish I understood and created a better plan and gave thought to how it would impact people who love and support me, people I will bring in, into my life. Because a mistake that I have made is I tend to minimize the experience. No big deal. It was a year and a minimum security camp. And while it might not have been a huge deal for me at times. It was a big deal to my wife. And going on that first date and describing that to her, that's a big deal. So many of my children will endure or learn the fact that their dad went to prison. Even my parents or people, friends, you know, soccer moms and dads, what do you do? And I tell them, they go to TikTok and YouTube and look at what I do. And it's so fascinating. And it consumes the conversation. I'm like, here I am again at my daughter's soccer practice talking about prison. And what happened and what I learned, because it's fascinating to, to some, it's certainly a conversation starter. But for me, at times, I'd love to say, I'm an accountant. <laughs> it's boring. Eh? Nobody want to talk about an accountant. So I think that first year, I made a mistake of, of just sort of overlooking how the persistent effects of how this, to a degree, is a lifelong sentence. But I want to be very clear as I wrap up this live video on Friday, June 2nd. If any of you think I am complaining, I am not. It took me years to 
express the gratitude that I try to convey in my messages. I try to remain humble and kind. I have it better than most. I should have appreciated that when, when I came home. And indeed, you coming home from, if you're coming home, you have it better than most, or there are things that you have that other people do not. I just wish I had embraced that perspective when I came home because it's taken many years. I filmed a live video last month called 11 Ways I Live Differently because I went to federal prison. That took years. So deck a 10 more than 10 years to get there. I want to shorten your learning curve. I'd love it if you can get in weeks, months, or a year that took me 13 or 14 years. If you can do that, these mistakes I made, how I articulate them to you will be of value to you. It will help you because we can't get the time back. And I wish it. I wish I had that time back. I wish I would have lived that first, second, and third year out of prison uh, uh, differently. I can't, but you can. And if that's the case and you want to do better, I hope this video helps you. Thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful weekend. Goodbye.